So, um, um, what we're going to do today is we're going to continue in uh, our hierarchy of things. So if you go back to the demo, thanks. Um, where we've been so far, to recall uh, our usual set of things, is we started off with Gaussian statistics, um, which had We'll see whether today is a good day or a bad day. Well, not bad, which had a nice uh, normal distribution. Um, so they have a nice mean and a variance. And then we expanded this to non-parametric statistics, where uh, we did not need to assume a form for the probability density function. So in this case, the PDF was Gaussian. That's the distribution. And then we went on to expand this to fractals where there are no moments. So there are no means and variances. And now we're going to take a slightly different approach, um, which is not more general than fractals, but different. And in this approach, we're going to go back to the reason why we thought we had a Gaussian in the first place. If you remember, we went through an argument that if we have, if the measurement down here is really caused by a large number of small random errors, that if we make a decision either way here, and by the time we get to the bottom, we'll have a distribution that resembles a Gaussian. And maybe I should focus this a little bit better. Um, what we're now going to discuss is, or describe, is what this word random means. Because we've, we've presumed so far that all of the errors, that is, all of the deviations, from our measure of central tendency are, in some sense, random. And we're now going to discuss whether the errors really are always random. Now, you can see that the fractals include, include cases where these moments don't, exi don't exist. In here, we're kind of assuming they do exist sometimes and sometimes we won't. So we'll, we'll deal with cases where the mean and variance do exist and cases where the mean and variance may not exist. So this is not a generalization of fractals, but will include some aspects related to fractals. So what I was saying is we're dealing, so far we've assumed only errors are random. And now we're going to ask whether the errors really are random. So it's sort of scary that I can talk for about 10 sentences and say the same thing in one sentence. But we'll sort of uh, we'll ignore that. Um, let me see if I want to say anything else as a backdrop to this. Um, Yeah, let me say something. I, in terms of fractals, you said that fractals or properties related to the statistics of fractals went back to about 200, uh, 250, 300 years, going back to one of the Bernoullis, one of the many Bernoullis. Um, to give you a sense of what we're going to talk about today, we'll see the jargon word for this is chaos. And we'll see that this is a bad word, bad word, uh, meaning that in normal usage, chaos means disordered, ordered. We're going to see that what it means here, so this is the normal usage, normal. But for us, uh, this will mean really an ordered system whose output is so complex, whatever that means, 
well, this is the Center for Complex Systems, so we're supposed to know what that means, is so complex that uh, it looks random. So jumping ahead, that's the definition of chaos. Now, these ideas of chaos really are, are more recent than the fractals. Um, this goes back to um, maybe 100 years ago. And Henry, Henry? Poincaré. Um, and the deal here is I haven't brought in the pictures of the King of Sweden, but sometimes when I give this, I have that, but I haven't brought them in today. Um, uh, in Sweden about this time, the King of Sweden wanted to find out whether the universe, which meant really the solar system, that is the sun and the planets, I was lucky I could remember all the symbols for the planets. I don't think I'm going to be able to do them. Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Oh, that's pretty good. So um, uh, is this system stable? That is, will the planets go around the sun forever? Obviously, the sun has to be red. Um, and let's make this the Earth. I don't have green. but. So uh, we have the Earth going, and is this going to happen forever, or will the subtle gravitational interactions um, between some planets affect the motions of others? So in the long run, one of these will just fly off. And so the King of Sweden proposed a contest to see whoever could write the best mathematical treatise on this. And uh, this dude, Henry Poincaré, from France was the guy who wrote the best essay and won the contest. And I have a whole book actually describing in detail exactly what Poincaré did. And there was one aspect of his proof which is considered wrong, which was corrected. It was really a technical, wasn't a big mistake. Um, basically what he said was right, but there were some technical aspects that were cor corrected later. And although Poincaré didn't coin the word chaos, this came much later, I think from Ed Ott, although I'm not sure, in the 1970s. Um, Poincaré basically started a lot of the mathematics and a lot of the principles that I'm going to discuss today. Um, and whenever I tell this story, nobody ever laughs, but um, I told this story once amongst a group of Norwegians. And there are a lot of subtle differences between people in, in Scandinavia. And um, a lot of people think the Swedes are too concerned about a lot of things. So when I told this story that the king of Sweden was issuing this big prize, all these Norwegians laughed. But, but that's the only people who ever laugh at this story. Um, so um, what the King of Sweden did was very useful because the work that was done by Poincaré, uh, which doesn't look spelt right there, but maybe it is. Um, so what we're going to describe is, first of all, the methods, although I won't say them explicitly, that Poincaré used, some of the methods that Poincaré used to deal with this problem. And basically, the result was that if you have three interacting gravitational bodies, if you have three different masses, and they interact by gravity, this system Poincaré discovered is very complicated. So we have a system that has only a few pieces, in this case, three pieces, and gravity interacting between them. And Poincaré showed that under certain circumstances, you can't predict what's going to happen with this system. And so this was the problem that Poincaré actually, um, actually worked on. So let me introduce this now, instead of in a historical way, in a logical way. And yeah. what did he say about the planets? Like in terms of the planets, he couldn't say anything directly. What he could say was that, in principle, it was possible that the solar system could be unstable. But he didn't, as far as I remember, he didn't say, given the current configuration, which of any planets would suddenly fly off. I think more modern work done five years ago suggests certainly that Pluto and maybe Neptune and some of the outer planets are most likely to fly off, so that there is a possibility of things flying off. Uh, the main deal with the solar system is the main components of the solar system are the Sun and uh, Jupiter. These have most of the mass. This has, I guess, a hundredth the mass of the sun. But these are the two big things. And everything else is kind of small compared to that. 
So things like the Earth or Mars uh, really depend on the interactions between really Saturn and this, uh, Jupiter and the Sun. In, in fact, Jupiter controls most of the comets coming near the Earth. So there's a cloud of, of comets which come very far, very far out. And um, um, when they come near Saturn, their path will be perturbed, and that's when we see them closer to the Sun or closer to the Earth. So the solar system basically corresponds to the Sun, the Earth, and something else if you're looking at. And so he showed that this was um, unpredictable. In terms of the comets, which are much less mass than the Earth, it's even much more unpredictable. But in terms of the main structure of the solar system, except for some of these outer planets, this is not drawn to scale. Um, I have this book, uh, which was published like in the 1950s, which I was looking at a few days ago, called Andy and His Wonderful Telescope. And it has this 1950s looking kid learning about astronomy. And at one point, they make a scale model of the solar system. So they have a ball representing the sun and oranges for the planets. And, and they're very far away. The solar system is mostly empty. So like the sun is in the room, but the orange is like a few blocks away and are across the street. So it's very big. So I'm not drawing this to scale. But those outer planets are more remote from the sun and also influenced by Jupiter. So those, I think, are more likely to. And, and Pluto which I will not say is the dog planet, um, is um, some of the, if this is the sun, actually the orbit of Pluto is more eccentric. Most of the orbits are more like circles. So um, Pluto is very small and is probably an escaped moon of one of the other planets, and, and so there's a good chance that it's going to be lost. But I think the, the issue are in terms of what the other planets are doing, and there's some evidence for chaos in the motion of the other planets, but I don't think there's any e evidence that the Earth or any of the big planets is immediately going to fly off. The most likely scenario is the sun burns up. So um, at some time between now, now is very close to now, and maybe, oh, I don't know, relatively short time, like, uh, oh, maybe a billion years, but could be like a million. Um, the sun will lose its interior nuclear fuel, will be exhaust its fuel in the center, and at that point the sun gets bigger and will expand up to the orbit of the Earth or beyond and everything boils. And so, so that's a more immediate scenario in terms of the solar system than the Earth flying off. So you're more likely to be hot than cold if something bad happens here. Uh, Yeah, for, yeah, yeah. Okay. So let me punch up the other picture. Um, what we see in this picture are two data sets, very creatively labeled uh, one and two. Um, you know, although sometimes they're labeled left and right. So this is, um, but here they're labeled one and two. And these data sets, what I've done is I've had some value of x at a given index number. That is, this is the first point and the second point and the third. And you can see the individual data points here. And just because I wanted to, I connected the points by lines. Or someone whose hand was less steady connected them by lines, if you look carefully on the screen. And the point is that these two data sets, they're, they're not exactly the same sequence of numbers. You can see that the sequence is different in each one a little bit. But they have sort of the same characteristics. It looks like there's roughly a random variation um, between these two data sets. Uh, that is, the random variation from one point to the next in this data. And if I go backwards, in fact, uh, I've uh, made these two data sets so that they have the same mean uh, and the same variance. Um, I don't really remember whether they're Gaussian or not. I'm not sure what the di probability density function is, but at least I computed the mean and variance. I did what I told you never to do, which is I computed the variance without checking whether it's Gaussian. But, but I did it. Um, and I've also looked at the power spectrum of these things. And so the power spectrum of both of these is actually the same, too. So these have basically the same properties that we've used to define statistics for our different types of data. But it turns out these two things are really very different. Uh, the first one is random, whatever the word random means. So I have here uh, a random number generator, and which means that I have some way of picking a random number between 0 and 1. And then each point, I pick some random number between 0 and 1. So I pick this point and that point and this point. 
And so it seems reasonable I get a random variation because I've picked a series of random numbers. But data set number two is actually completely different than this. And data set number two is not random at all. It is absolutely deterministic, meaning that the next value is actually, in every case, 3.95 times the previous value times 1 minus the previous value. And this is what we're going to call chaos. So if I have the value of this point, I, from, I plug it into this equation, compute the next point, from that compute the next point, et cetera, and I get this pattern that looks random. Now this is very surprising, because we're used to thinking if we have an equation, and we start the equation somewhere and we repeat the equation, if the equation is a well-defined form, that the function we get out of it should have a well-defined form. And in fact, that's not what we have here. We have an equation that's producing something that if we didn't know better, might look as if it was random. And that's why the word chaos was chosen to describe this, because the output of here looks chaotic. And this is so surprising that let me try to make clear exactly what's going on here. As I said, this is the uh, equation that uh, the next value of x is 3.95 times x times 1 minus x. And you might wonder why I picked 3.95. And the answer is that I tried lots of different numbers and the data that came out of 3.95 looked good. Um, this is not so silly because I could pick any number here between 1 and 4. And sometimes people pick four because they think it's very chaotic. Um, but this chaos consists of, um, let, me, let me make a more technical point about what, what the chaos is. In, in this case, the x will go to infinity as you keep repeating it. Okay. So in order to keep this bounded, in order to keep the values of x between 0 and 1, we have to keep that number between 1 and 4. See, I know the answer to that. <laughs> OK. Um, what chaos means here, I'm going to say this in a really technical sense. So I'll say it first with a little less jargon, and then I'll say it with a lot of jargon. What this random signal really consists of is a sum of periodic signals Of, and, and this sum of periodic signals includes signals of all possible periods. So we have signals of different heights, of different frequencies, and we add all of those together in some combination, and that makes the chaos. And now let me say it in a slightly more technical way. We have in here, in the chaos, we have the sum of all periods, but each period is of measure 0. That is, each, we can look through this signal and find a short stretch or a longer stretch that has some period in it if, if, if we take all. Uh, the infinitely long signal. So we can. Sorry, what do you mean by period? Period means um, the time between when the signal repeats. So this would be a longer period, and this would be a shorter period. Okay. So it means that when we look at at the whole signal, we can always find a stretch that has some given period in it, but it doesn't last very long. In a technical mathematical sense, we say it has measure zero, which means something if you know what those words mean. Um, <coughs> so that's, that's the nature of the chaos, that it consists of everything. And let me go back here again, because I'm trying to explain why I picked 3.95. Even though it consists of every, every period, period, depending on the value that I pick here, different periods, in essence, are weighted differently. 
in the sum, contribute more or less to the sum. This is kind of true. What I just said before was exactly true. Now I'm kind of getting closer to the edge, and it's slipping a little bit, but I think this is still true. And as I change this number a little bit, which terms go into the sum changes a little bit, so the character of the signal changes a little bit. So I picked a 3.95 because to me, by eye, that looked the most random. When I pick slightly different numbers, I include different periods, and the quality of the signal changes a little bit. There's some reason to suggest that the number 4.0 makes this, the signal mostly chaotic or more chaotic than other numbers. But when you actually look at the signal at 4, I thought it looked less random than 3.95. So that's why I chose 3.95. And you can picture me on the computer in New York putting in different numbers and watching it go on the screen to try to pick one that looked the most random. Of course, programs running in BASIC. So uh, let's get back to uh, the computer. Thanks. Um, if I start off with the first value being 0.892, and let me say something about this. Uh, we'll see a little bit later that when I start this at any reasonable number, eventually the first few numbers may be off for a while from what I'm really looking for, but then they'll converge rapidly to being more normal. So it doesn't matter so much where I start. When I repeat this a little bit, we get to the more normal behavior. Well, let, let me say that in, in a picture. That is, we start the calculation at some number, uh, x0. And eventually, x1 will be a function of x0 and will continue down uh, to xn. Um, it doesn't matter usually so much where I start as long as this is reasonable. Usually, in a relatively short time, maybe by x10 or x100, I'll get to something where all these values and all the subsequent values have some sort of, I'll say, stable, not in any technical sense, characteristic. I'm not going to characteristic. Okay. The numbers at the very beginning may not have that characteristic, and we're going to call those the transient. But eventually, or in relatively short time, we'll see why the time is short later, the transient will be finished and then we'll be in this more stable area. So it doesn't so much matter where I start this calculation. I don't know where I started this particular one, but usually when I start these, I usually start them at a half. So what I've done is probably evolve this calculation a number of times to be in this more stable region and eventually reach this number 0.892 is probably what happened. So here, in order to just deal with the stable characteristics, I've just started at the number 0.892. And in order to get the next number, I multiply that by 3.95 times 1 minus 0.892, and I get 0 0.380. And then I take the 0 0.380, and I do the same business on, I get 0 0.931, and I iterate and get 253, 747, 746, et cetera etc. So now, uh, if I make a plot of those numbers, these are a plot of those numbers, this is that thing that looks like chaos. And that's why they called it chaos, because it looks like something random is really going on here. So that was the use of the word. As I said, I think it's a poor choice of words. I would have said a few months bad choice of words, but everybody corrects me. I should say poorly instead of bad, because it has something to do with adjectives and nouns that I don't fully understand. But uh, um, it's a poor choice of words because chaos normally means disordered. And here, chaos means a system that's highly ordered, but whose output is so complex that it looks random. Well, if that's the case, how can we tell randomness from chaos? And this shows one way to do that. What I've done here is I've taken the first and second data point and made believe, let me do it on the Elmo. So first data point is x1, and the next one is x2. Let me make big x's. Uh, x3, x4. What I'm going to do is take the first two data points and just make believe 
that the y coordinate is equal to the first point and the x coordinate the second one. So I'm going to have a set of pairs which will represent some point in space. So this will be the y axis and this is the x axis. Um, and um, I'll plot that point. So this will be uh, correspond to x1, x2. And then I'll take the next two points. I can do it overlapping. I can take x2 and x3. And I can plot x2 equal now to x and x3 equal to y. And I'll get a different point. So this is x2, this is x3, et cetera. And I keep taking pairs of points and transforming the first point into the x value and the second point into the y value and then plotting that point. And this is what was directly related to what Poincaré did. And this has a name. And it's called an embedding, which may or may not have that number of Ds in it, and, which I think it does, actually. Does it? OK. And um, um, how, how would you know? You have, you've only seen that from the times I've written it, right? You went, uh, <laughs> this, is this is an example of circular reasoning. So um, um, basically what the embedding does, it takes a time series and transforms it into what I'll call a geometric object. <coughs> and then we can study the properties of this object, particularly its more generalized spatial properties, which are called topology. And although all the original properties in the time series are or in essence just reappearing here, this transformation makes it easier to understand and analyze certain things, even though it's the same information. And so this gives us a way of analyzing the data or pulling out properties of the data we could not do directly from the time series. And this is the procedure that Poincaré invented in the 1890s. Um, how exactly we do this, I mean, we can pick non-overlapping numbers. For example, I can separate these by some distance. Uh, I might pick, for example, these two and then those two. Um, how we decide to pick these things is technically called the lag. And we have to do it right, otherwise it doesn't work. And right has to do with certain properties of the equations. Um, in this case, I can say in a qualitative sense what the technical right is. Is we want, um, well, I've even represented it wrong here. I mean, um, w what we could have done in order to make the x and y, we could have picked this one as x and this one as y. Okay. What, what, what we need to do is to pick these far enough apart so that we see what's going on in the system, but not so far apart that they're disconnected with each other. And, and that can be done by measures of the autocorrelation function or something called mutual information or entropy. There are a number of different ways to pick how we do this. And most of those ways don't work in handling real data. They work in handling model equations perfectly or very well. But handling real data, how we make this choice, is very difficult and sometimes impossible to get right. Okay, so that's the, there's an important practical <coughs> problem there. But this shows the result. And this is the actual real result. So this is not something that we fudged up. Uh, but uh, I've extended this time series to 2,000 points, about 2,000 points. And that means I don't remember whether it's actually 2,001 or 1,999. But it's near, near 2,000. I always have trouble with loop termination criteria. So, uh, but it's about 2,000 points. And I have plotted then each of the 1,199 or whatever, you know, because it will be one less, right? It's uh, <coughs> uh, plotted them over here. And you can see that this pretty much fills up this two-dimensional space. So the other way to say this is this is a plot of the nth value against the nth plus 1 value. And this is what happens when I do this for data set number 1. Now look what happens when I do this for data set number 2. It's very different. Data set number 2 
turns out to be this parabola. And if you think about it, that's kind of obvious because this equation is the equation for a parabola. So given the value of xn, we always have xn plus 1, the point on the parabola. So the point is that this thing fills up this two-dimensional space, and this thing doesn't. It's one-dimensional. Now, I could take three points at a time here and use this to fill up a three-dimensional space, or four points and fill up a four-dimensional space, or five points and fill up a five-dimensional space. I can't show you the five-dimensional space picture because I haven't given you the special glasses that allow you to see that, you know, it's got red, blue, yellow, orange, and green on it, and, uh, and it flickers. So um, um, no matter what space I put this data into, it will fill up that space. But this data, no matter what space I put it into, even if I put it into a five-dimensional space, it will still be this one-dimensional line. And this fact that the dimensionality of this phase space, which is what this is called, is less than filling, is the defining characteristic here. And this is called an attractor. <coughs> so let me, uh, let me say that here, that when we do this embedding, so when we transfer the time series to an object, the hallmark of chaos is that the dimension of the object is less than the dimension of this graph is called a phase space. And that when we have this, this true, then we call the object in the phase space Let me just call it an attractor. We'll discuss later why it's a strange attractor. And this is the hallmark of chaos. So this is the hint that the system is not random, really, although the time series look random. I should say that what I'm going to do this time and maybe next time is in these two sets of lectures, I'm going to do basically all of Ming Zhu Ding's course is basically what I'm doing. So I don't know how many of you are currently taking that or are you currently taking that? Ming Zhu Ding's course or you did take it? You are. What I'm emphasizing here kind of the qualitative things of what's going on there. Okay. So let's see what happens next there. So now we have the three properties that I think define what chaos is. The first one is that it's deterministic. And what deterministic means is that from some previous set of values, we can compute the next value. So that's what deterministic means. And this can be implemented in two different ways. Um, it can be implemented in, so this is deterministic. And it can be implemented in two ways. We can have discrete values of x that then predict the next x. And this would be called a map. Or we can have continuous values of x. And then what we use is the values of x at some point, let's say this is time, plus the derivatives of whatever order we need and that predicts then the next value of x at some given time, t naught. So this would be continuous. So we can have equations that are discrete, that have fixed values of x, and that's what we've been looking at so far in the, this uh, equation, which is called the logistic equation with the 3.95. So we can either have discrete functions or continuous functions that predict the next value of x. What is what called? Continuous? continuous versus discrete. Yeah, but there you said it's a map, and if they're not. Um, I would just call this a function. Um, we can call this um, a differential equation. So this is a differential equation, and this is a difference equation.
So this is a differential equation for the continuous, and this is called the difference equation. And they have somewhat different mathematical properties. Which I've managed not to explain. So we'll just, because uh, it's not important. But the basic problem is, the basic point is that we have this deterministic system we can predict next points. This is one of the properties of chaos, defining properties. The second property, um, this is a little more, as we would say in the business, controversial. Um, I think this is an important part of this definition, but not everybody would agree. But to me, it's important that the number of variables here be small. I think that's usually what we mean by chaos, although this is formally not in the definition. So this means that the next value of x depends on the previous values of x, but not on an infinite number of those values or a very large number, but in this case it depends on 3. And 3 is small. And how many do you have to be before it's not small? I don't know, but you know, it's like 6 would still be small to me. And 10 is small, but an infinite number is not small, or 100,000 is not small. I, I think this is an important part of the definition because there are mathematical systems that depend on a large number of variables that have somewhat different mathematical properties than this sort of simple chaos that I'm describing here. So I think this is a useful part of the definition. And uh, the last part of the definition is that the output of the system is complicated. So even though it's deterministic and it depends on a small number of degrees of freedom, a small number of variables, the output is very complicated. And here we see a very complicated output. So looking at this, there would be no way uh, to tell for me what, what's going on here and no way to predict the next number. Although, as we heard in the journal club, apparently people can look at these things and predict what the next number is, which I still find surprising. Um, now, the properties of chaos, so those are kind of the definitions or the aspects of the definitions. The result of these is, first of all, is that when we create a phase space, that when the phase space is infinite dimensional, so what you're looking at here so you can't see the axis because this is an embedding in a very high dimensional system. And if you had your glasses, your, you, know, with the, you could see the, the fact that this is really at least five dimensional. But the chaos is intrinsically low dimensional. So that the phase space plot of the chaos is low dimensional. This is one of the characteristics, that, properties that result from those definitions. A second property, and we'll see this in more detail, is this is illustrated in some symbolic way that somehow we're in some space here that represents the initial values. And here the initial values are a little bit different from each other. But as the system evolves in time, the initial values stay close, but then they become wildly different. So this is called sensitivity to initial conditions. That if we start very close, but not exactly the same point, and in real experiments, how can we ever start at exactly the same point? Okay. Um, then we're going to diverge very fast eventually. And this is called sensitivity to initial conditions. And another property of chaos is something called the bifurcation. What that means is we have some parameter that determines what the system is doing. So in the equations we've used, the parameter would be the 3.95, because I could have made that 3.67, for example, or 4. And we get a certain characteristic pattern. Uh, so actually, this pattern would correspond to a number of about, I think, 3-something or 2-something. I don't remember. But if I change that 3.95 to some appropriate number that I can't remember, I'll get this pattern. But if then I alter that parameter just a little bit, it will change to a very different pattern. And this sudden change in the behavior of the system when we change a parameter that it depends in a small way is called a bifurcation. And there's a more mathematical way to define that, but I think this is, this is good enough. And we can see immediately this is not a linear system. In a linear system, if we change something in a small way, the system changes in a small way. But here we change something in a small way, and the system changes in a big way. Okay? So this is really unusual and is nonlinear. So now let's, uh, let's discuss how actually to do some of these things. 
So let me discuss a little bit how to do an embedding and what the properties are of, of such an embedding. So uh, let's say we're given a time series of three variables, x, y, and z. It's not so clever, but uh, choice of creative choice of numbers, but it's not a bad choice. Um, and I pick these x, y, and t from a particular example of which we will learn more about later. When I have these three variables, what I'd like to do is to combine them to make a geometric object. Because that's what, what Poincaré suggested, is studying the topology of the objects was useful. And here's how I can do it. I can generate this thing which we're calling a phase space. And what I do is I have uh, x, y, and z on this phase space. And every time I have a set of x, y, z values, I can plot a point there. And as the values of x, y, and z change, I'll sculpt out something in this three-dimensional phase space. OK, so you got it so that we can convert separate time series together into one object. I usually say when I show this picture or a similar picture that, that I hope you understand it. Now when I said it, it sounded clear to me. But I would say it took me about five years to get this idea of the phase space. This is a really very subtle concept. Uh, and if it looked simple, what we were doing here, that's great. Because what's really going on here is by doing this embedding, we've entirely changed how we're going to analyze the data. And everything we deal with now will be in terms of this phase space and not the original data. But we're going to see that this is the way to get at the properties of what was in the original. So we've transformed the entire problem into a different problem. Okay? And now we're even going to forget about what those time series and do everything on the analysis here. So this is really a big change. And it's also surprising that we can do this, that somehow we have one thing which we can call thing one, <laughs> and that we can do a transformation of this thing, and as you might suspect, we'll let me call this thing number one transformed, because it's not thing two. It's really thing number one transformed. That it may be easy to figure out the properties of this thing and hard to figure out the properties of that thing. And this is very strange because they're the same thing. We've just done a transformation and hasn't altered it. But in general, this is a very useful thing to do sometimes, that it may be very difficult to figure out the properties of, of thing number one, but after the transformation, it may be easy to figure out its properties. So this is a surprising thing. What we do a lot of times in mathematics and in life is we keep trying to figure out the hard stuff, and that's, that doesn't work sometimes. So it's easier to transform the, the hard thing to an easy thing and then work on the easy thing. And then you can get like, you know, a gold star for doing it. So, so then it's much easier. Okay. And, and this is, again, the very brilliant idea that Poincaré had to analyze the orbits. That he went away from uh, the things we're talking about here are the time series and everything else you can do on the time series that you can learn from Stephen Bressler. So power spectra and correlation functions and statistics and everything else. And now we're transforming it into an object. Again, the transformation we use is called an embedding. And in this object, we're studying the topology. And we'll see that that means things like, the, as we have already seen, the dimension of the object. We defined dimension uh, last time or the time before. Um, and from aspects of the topology, then we can learn things about this object. So this is the. Uh, uh, the thing that Poincaré uh, won his um, crowns, the Swedish crowns, I forget what they are. Okay, so, oh no. Um, let's see if we're okay. This computer crashes by itself every once in a while because it just does that, but it hasn't crashed this time. It sent up a warning as well as, of course, listing the name of Cartman's father, which I was able to uh, uh, deal with fast enough. OK, so let's look at uh, examples of attractors in the phase space. So this is the logistic equation, which you've already seen. 
has an attractor in the phase space of this form. And this is another example. Uh, in fact, this is where those x, y, and z came from. Uh, this is a set of equations that I'll describe in a little more detail a little bit later uh, or, or next week called the Lorentz equations uh, from Lorentz. And um, this is the phase space and the attractor of what this looks like. Uh, Hans Otto Paikin makes an interesting point about Lorentz, which is, which is maybe worth, worth making here in, in, a, in a general sense. And I don't think this is a point that I've made before. Uh, Lorentz came from a very formal mathematical background. Um, so Lorentz was trained, I think, at Harvard by Birkhoff, who was probably the greatest mathematician of the generation before uh, Lorentz in the US. And Lorentz's training um, was very formally mathematical, very formal and very comprehensive mathematical background. And I think the work that is described on that um, PowerPoint slide was done while Lorentz was at MIT, but after that I think he was at the um, National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder. The point was, as we'll see a little bit later, Lorentz found something very funny from these equations, which we now identify as chaos. But because of his mathematical background, he was able to analyze them in a way that someone else would have not been able to do. And so Lorenz, who was doing mathematical calculations on his computer, was able to go back and analyze things because of his previous background. This is a very, very important point in how we handle things in science, that your entire background and where you come from sometimes allows you to see things that you wouldn't see otherwise. And in my new book, the opening quotation is from uh, Louis Pasteur that says that chance favors the, pre the prepared mind. And I think this is a very important point, and I think Hans Otto makes it very clearly in terms of Lorentz because it was his, his entire intellectual background that allowed him when this weird thing came up to deal with it. And if he had not had that background and the inclination to use that background, then he wouldn't have done this. And this is a very important point, that all of the crap that you take before also provides background for you to approach problems. And even if you don't use things for a number of years, you can always go back when you see something. And it's both the knowledge and the inclination that comes from this previous background. So this is an important point in how this happened. Um, the other way I say this sometimes is you can walk into the lab and you can see that there is some mold growing on your bacterial colonies. And, and the mold is actually spreading something that's killing the bacteria. And you can curse and say that the mold has ruined the experiment and throw everything away. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, um, I'm trying not to say that they were saying who Cartman's father was, but I can't, haven't <laughs> succeeded in doing that. Uh, you can either say that the dishes with the bacteria are ruined, the experiments are ruined, throw them away, or you can go in and discover penicillin that the mold is producing something useful. And although it may seem obvious that when something important happens, you should pick up on it, it's very, very difficult to realize when something important has happened. And, and Lorenz was able to do this. And that takes more insight and more background than you might think. So, pushing the button. Um, the crucial point about the phase space is this, that the fractal dimension of the attractor is less than or equal to the number of independent, let me say it this way, the number of independent variables that represent the equation is the smallest integer that's greater than or equal to the fractal dimension of the attractor. So, if we have this uh, phase space here, and the dimension of this is a little bit less than 1 for 3.95, the smallest integer greater than a number a little bit less than 1 is 1. 
So that means that this time series can be represented by an equation with one variable. Okay, this is the important meaning of the phase space. And the second example is given here. It turns out that the dimensionality of this uh, Lorenz attractor is about 2.03. And so the smallest integer greater than 2.03 is what? What? Three. Good. Um, so uh, I feel I should hand you a little plastic toy or something. <laughs> but um, um, we gave away plastic toys in one of my other classes, but not not here because on the video class we have people at a remote site and we couldn't see them so I gave them noisemakers <laughs> so that they could tell me when they had questions. And it didn't quite work because you had to push a button on the microphone anyhow to create the sound coming through. But I, since there were many different people I bought the many different noisemakers so we had little cricket things and whistles and oohs. <laughs> and, and, so, but I, and then I tried to give the extra ones away here to the rest of the class, and they wouldn't take them. The undergraduates here sat in the chairs and wouldn't take the extra oohs, et cetera. So, okay, so um, l let me write this down on the Elmo because this is a crucial point. Yeah. What? Oohs. <laughs> there are many words that I can't spell, so that's uh, not unique. The smallest integer, smallest integer greater than the dimension of the attractor is equal to the number of independent variables needed and number of independent variables will also equal the number of equations needed to generate the time series. It will be the number needed to generate the attractor, but we're saying the attractor is just a transformation of the time series. So we'll be able to generate the time series. So in what we've seen in the logistic equation, which is what this is called, x to the n plus 1 equals 3.95, x to the n, 1 minus x to the n. In this case, for 3.95, the dimension of this is a little bit less than 1. And so it means that from looking at the phase space, we know that one equation and one variable can generate it. And in terms of the Lorentz system, we know that there's the dimension is 2.03, and that means we need three independent variables and three equations to generate its time series. Or even the time series of one of the variables, because they're all linked together. So this is the crucial point of what the phase space is telling us. And this comes, again, from the phase space. which is where we evaluate the attractor. And I can scroll this up if someone is still writing. Although it seems like there should be like theme music from uh, Gone with the Wind or something as I scroll up. But, uh, okay, this, so this is an, a, an essential, crucial point of this whole analysis. And to amplify this point, basically, if the dimension of the attractor is small, then from what I've said, then we have chaos. And if the dimension of the attractor is, is let's say, infinite, then that's what we're really calling random. So say it in a different way. What we mean by random is we have an infinite number of independent variables, an infinite number of different, again to use a technical word, different things going on at the same time. And that's what random means. So we got a lot of separate things going on, so we can't figure out what's going on. But chaos means that we got a few things going on, and so we can figure out the equation of those few things. Maybe if we could close the door, someone could close the door so we, we get less of the, uh, um, uh, 
All right, thanks. This interpretation is not, is, is one that I'm not completely comfortable with, but I think is a good way of looking at things and was hard for me in some ways. Because if we say that the number of independent variables is equal to the dimensionality, when we're infinite, we must be infinite dimensional. And that's, I think, what we mean by random. That it's so complicated that in principle, we can't figure out what's going on and write down all equations. And that's what I think what we mean by random. Lots of separate things are going on all the time. OK. So let's continue now. Um, and this gives some example of doing this analysis. So here uh, we have a time series. And this is uh, actually produced by a random mechanism. And this is a different time series, which was produced by a deterministic mechanism. Now, there's something out of sequence. so. Just forget about it. Um, how do we construct the phase space? So the question is now, I've told you how important the phase space is. How do we make it up from the data, construct it or generate it from the data? Well, one way, if we have three different measurements and we want to make a three-dimensional phase space, we do the three measurements and we plot the points. Uh, each point will correspond to one set of measurements in x, y, and z. So this is one thing we could do. But it turns out we can do a trickier thing. That is, we can construct the entire phase space not from all three measurements, but from one measurement. This is an out, out, surprising, outstandingly odd thing. Because we got three different things going on in this system. And we can tell everything about the system from only measuring one of those three things. This is very strange. Okay? The reason why it works is because the three things are not independent. If you switch to the camera for a second, uh, me, yeah, thanks. Um, if we have these three things going on, they're all tangled together. All three variables are connected to each other by the equations. So that means that measuring just one of them, because they're all entangled, allows us to measure properties that are related to all three. So you can go back to the computer now. Thanks. Um, and the ability to do this is called Tacken's theorem. And basically what it says, let's see what we have here. OK. Um, what Tacken's theorem basically says is that we can make a phase space. And we make the phase space with the coordinates x of t, x delayed by delta t, x delayed by 2 delta t, et cetera. So now these aren't x, y, and z, but they are a different kind of coordinates called a lag coordinate. This is the way most data is analyzed in this business. So it turns out this is the phase space we have that makes the most sense, x, y, and z. We can have another phase space that's equivalent by taking x dx dt and the second derivative, these are, this also forms an orthogonal phase space if the equations are related. Now what we're doing is not this, but we're doing a phase space here that's x of t, x of t plus delta t, and x of t plus 2 delta t. So to say that in a different way, these are the x values. Uh, if delta t is 1, we're picking uh, this one, this one, and that one, which is what I said before. OK, is the three. So this would be x of t, x of t plus delta t. So the delta t is 1 in x of t plus 2 delta t. But we might pick them differently. We might pick them, we made delta t a bigger number. We might pick this one, this one, and that one. OK, so that would be a different delta t. Okay. Only part of the equation is coupled. If you've not got x, you need 
Now, where, where is it? this, I think, implicitly assumes that all the variables are coupled to each other. Now, what we're actually calculating is this phase space, not this one. But these two are related to each other. For example, I can make up the derivative of the x dt is something like this, right? So that the x dt, this coordinate, this coordinate is related to these two coordinates as a linear combination of them, or a linear difference. And this is just a constant. It doesn't matter. The point is that this coordinate system is a linear transformation of that coordinate system. This is a linear transformation. Okay. And it turns out the crucial fact is that the dimension in the phase space is independent of linear transformations. Or maybe a better way of saying it is invariant, that is, it doesn't change under a linear transformation. So what we do is we calculate, it, this is called that lag space with the delta t's, and we get a dimension, and that dimension will be the same dimension as that other space with the derivatives or the real correct space uh, done by the three variables. So we can compute the dimension here, but we know that that dimension is the same as the dimension of the other phase spaces, if certain things are true. Okay. What, what do those things need to be true? So this is if. There's a list of some things that need to be true. Some of the things are very subtle, and I'm not going to tell you about them. So exactly what's needed to make this work is actually not completely understood. And for example, Jim Collins had a few articles this last year, two articles last year in Physical Review Letters, uh, extending what was thought to be known in order to do this. So there are a number of subtle things. The less subtle thing is the choice of delta t, which I said is hard to do in real data. If we're approximating the derivatives, then in some sense we want delta t small enough so that we get a good approximation of the derivatives. But we want delta t uh, large enough so we get a good approximation of the derivatives. If we take these too close together, we'll get 0 over 0. Right? If you're trying to estimate the slope of something, if you take two points too close together, it's hard to figure out. You need two points that are kind of a reasonable distance to get the slope. But we have to have delta t small enough, because if we look over too big a distance, we'll get the wrong answer for the slope. So we need delta t in some middle range in order to make these derivatives reasonable. And that's how you choose delta t. This is a long, complicated explanation of it, but that's OK. So um, let me show you examples. Uh, here are some real examples from biology. This is from uh, Malvin Teich's group, who was here uh, not so long ago. And what they've done here is construct the, um, let me make a picture of what they're doing a little bit. They have a hair cell in the ear. These are cells that detect sound, hearing. So. Um, uh, the hair cell has uh, hair on it and a bunch of little kind of wires that stick it down too. And each one of these is tuned to a different frequency in the cochlea. And they shine light on these. This is light. And the light gets reflected in from a heterodyne interference detector. Um, they can measure both the position and the velocity of the top of the hair cells. And they can measure in reasonably good accuracy. I always forget what it is, but it's on the order of a fraction, maybe it's a hundredth of an angstrom. So it's like a fraction of the diameter of an atom because it's a very sensitive measurement. So it's really a very exquisitely sensitive measurement. So now if they measure the position and the velocity, 
and they can do a phase-based plot. And these are done by Susan Kielsen, I think, and one of them is over here. And here they've plotted velocity versus displacement, and you can see they have what looks to be what we might call a limit cycle, but it's a low-dimensional attractor. And this is a certain st cell being stimulated at a certain frequency. When they stimulate the same cell at a different frequency, uh, they get an attractor that looks more random. It's more spread over the place. And at a different, oh, I only have two frequencies. I thought I had three. So um, this shows the use of a phase space generated from measuring all the variables. This is usually not the way it's done. Usually people only do one measurement and from that construct the phase space. So let me give you some examples of that. Um, let's use the example of, that I've been giving all along from data number one and data number two. Uh, data number one, remember, was this random data. And if I create an embedding, the space has to be large. The embedding cannot be, the dimensionality of the attractor cannot be larger than the space I put it in. So that's important enough to write down. The dimensionality of the attractor cannot be larger than the space I put it in. So for example, if I'm out here uh, on a sunny day, my shadow, which is on the ground, is in essence an embedding in a two dimensions, and my shadow is going to be two dimensional, even though I'm um, three dimensional, and sometimes even four dimensional if I move. So. Um, um, we, when we do an embedding, the, the, the object in the space cannot be bigger than the space. So in order to tell how many dimensions there are in the space, I presume no one needs to copy the picture of me. So. But um, what we, 